Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm here this morning on a surprise visit. Uh, wasn't planning on doing it this quick, but I was um, asked to do a session on blended learning today. So that's what I am going to do. Uh, thank you for all the teachers that have requested this. I think it's one of those that um, people know that it's out there, but they may not be comfortable with it at this point. So I'm going to give you some examples of how to implement this in your classroom. And hopefully, uh, if you have questions, there is some contact information at the end of this. Feel free to reach out and I'll be happy to help out as much as I can. So first off, like I said, this is a blended learning session and I am Norm Potter. I'm the owner of Structured Creativity Consulting. Uh, I apologize for the informal garb, but like I said, this is sort of a last minute uh, deal. I, I am representing one of the schools that I worked with, uh, Dundee, Michigan, uh, Dundee Middle School, but also the home of uh, the state of wrestling in Michigan goes through uh, Dundee, if you don't know anything about it. Also, there's a huge Cabela's there. Uh, it's really boom since that has, has gone in. But anyway, moving forward, this is about blended learning. And uh, I want to make sure that I am as clear as possible when we get into these different types of structures. Um, but more importantly, actually, what happens with the teaching? So if you are interested and you are moving through some of the things that I have given here. I do have a badging system that we can uh, turn you on to. Uh, there are quite a few teachers out there that have been at level one and two of the badging system, uh, and I can go through that if you're interested. So again, contact me if you need to. So let's start with this definition because it has changed, and I know that everybody has their own sort of view of what blended learning looks like. So I'm going to go with the classroom blended learning, which is a classroom setting where a teacher will use traditional teaching methods as well as technology to provide the effective learning opportunities for students. You know, when blended learning first came out, we often thought of a home component and a school component, which obviously we all have been part of because of the pandemic. But this is now moving into a way to save time, but also be extremely effective in how you teach your students. So I, I think the key to any blended learning model that you implement, it has to be set up properly. And with that being said, the proper setup really depends on each teacher and comfort levels and rapport with students and how you can make things better uh, within the structure of your own physical setting, but also your mental state. So when we start looking at this, one of the things that most people think is that you really have to build a brand new lesson to do this. I often want especially veteran teachers, just to look at their lesson and deconstruct it and pull out the different parts because those different parts could be part of a station rather than spread out over two or three days. It could happen at one time just in a rotation or in some other type of model. So when we look at a typical lesson, a typical uh, traditional classroom lesson where you have direct instruction, you may have students reading, you may have students do some technology, whatever that may be, if you are doing that in your direct instruction and you're blocking out time for the whole class to do each one of those, you could easily break those lessons down and have a station of direct teaching, which gives you smaller groups. You could have a reading station of the materials for informational reading. You could have a 21st century skills station with technology. You could have an assessment station. It really is set up. So if you look at your current lessons, you could easily break those down and create stations with those. And the, the value of that, obviously, you get students to be, become more self-directed. Uh, and you also have that time with a small group to really hone in on the direct instruction that's needed for specific students. Not only special needs students, but also your gifted students and anybody in between, just because everybody has specific needs. Which leads us to the next piece. When you know your students, you know what you need to do. Uh, using data to inform instruction, which is part of the OTES 2.0, if you know your, your data and you know your students, you're going to have a, a great um, amount of success in this blended learning format. It really lends itself to students' growth and also to performance um, and moving forward in, in the curriculum. I'm going to give you several types of 
blended learning models that are physical models, um, you're obviously not limited to that. When I taught this just yesterday to my students at Kent State, uh, one student said, what if I come up with something different than what you have? And I said, that's amazing. So let's go ahead and do it. Because again, the needs of your students will determine some of these models that will work best. You have to expect um, that your mindset as a teacher has to change. You have to allow students to fail and make mistakes and learn on their own and also some classroom management pieces. But reality, when it comes into it, you'll have a small station of direct instruction where you'll have a very focused feedback session with students or a teaching session with students. Or if you're not in a direct instruction station, you become more, you re really become more of a facilitator rather than the, the end all be all of information. So it's a mindset change for a teacher and how you go about this really is going to change your approach. Um, with that being said, you cannot expect to do a blended learning uh, model the very first time and have everything be just roses. You have to expect there's a learning curve for students and for you to make sure that this happens the way you want it to happen. So if there is failure the first time, failure is a good thing in, in regards to how fluid it was, how much learning happened, how much behavior or how many behavioral issues came up. Those are all going to get better the more you do them. If you want kids to learn how to do something, you have to do it more than once. So make sure that you have that mindset going in that this isn't going to be perfect the first few times. It, it could take a while for you to find your groove and for the students to find their groove to make it happen. And the last part is flexible seating. Now, when we look at flexible seating in today's modern age, we have, you know, the stand up desk, we have beanbag chairs and couches and comfy chairs and chairs that rock and all these other things. Uh, those are all great. And those are obviously things that would really lend itself to a blended learning model because you can move things around easily. But anybody knows you if you have a line of desks, you can create pods of desks. Um, the only room I can think of that may be non conducive to this is your science classrooms, old style science classrooms, where I had tables bolted to the floor, you couldn't move them no matter what. But you, you still can rearrange the chairs to make it fit your needs. You can't change the tables, but you can still change groupings. So don't let the term flexible seating stick into your mind of that modern green and orange kind of combination that you know you see in more of the modern settings. So additionally, when you start looking at these blended learning models, if you're not familiar with Hattie and Webb here in Ohio, you really need to make sure that you start looking at those to create opportunities that are effective, but also create more rigor. Um, so the physical piece is, you know, a main part of this presentation, but also what happens at those stations really is important. And if you look at Hattie and you use maybe the jigsaw method to create groups or you do some direct instruction is one that's pretty high. Um, you know, this, this, the self grading of assessments is huge. Those could all be stations that are working within a standard. And within webs, you could have a station that's a, a level one, a level two, or a level three, and make sure that all the kids get different levels as needed according to their skill level and their preparedness for that area. Um, if you are uh, one of the lucky ones that can do integration in your classroom and feel comfortable doing that or have or have a great team that's willing to do that. You know, you could have a station for different subjects that will help focus on um, a, a group project dynamic. So if you have an integrated unit between social studies and language arts, you could have the writing station and the informational reading station, but then you could also have the social studies focus on that station if you choose. So there's a lot that could happen um, in that station. It's just a matter of how open and flexible you are. And the last part is really the basic skills. This is something that one of my math groups did tremendously well. They identified, and this is a seventh grade classroom, they identified that there are a ton of students that really struggle with fractions still. So they created a station that within the rotation, no matter what the subject was or what the content was, they had a fraction station. And the kids that worked were working on basic skills when they got there, they worked on the basics of fractions. 
the kids that already knew them, now they were working on the speed of understanding fractions and, and converting fractions and getting into the deeper rigor of a fraction. So the basic skills could be something that you could enhance through this method. And it could be writing, it could be reading, it could be whatever you want it to be or whatever that skill is. I know that at one point I focused on how to measure, you know, using a ruler, which sounds crazy, but in seventh grade, I had a great number of kids that couldn't do it. So those basic skills stations could be a huge benefit. And the, the, the gifted kids, like I said, you still have opportunities there because there's always some type of self-competition they could have, like how quick can I do things? Um, we know that speed sometimes does help with some calculations. And if they can do the basics, then we can turn them on to the uh, higher level thinking uh, a little bit more readily. So as we are getting into this, for the Ohio teachers, I already mentioned that I want to reinforce this, that Hattie and Webb really are important to understand. I do have um, other pieces out there about that. So if you look at my website or if you look at the YouTube channel, you'll, you'll see that. But we're going to get into these models now, and I want to give credit where I found the best examples of these. If you look at the website down here, it's www.blendedlearning.org and its models. Uh, I... I and basically using that website with a few modifications and my own ideas that go with it. But this is a great starting point and a great resource for all those um, looking for a good resource on blended learning. I would highly recommend going to that site and uh, hopefully you'll get what you need if, if, if I don't give you what you need today. So we're gonna start with these different models and I labeled them this way because it helps me keep them straight in my head. Um, so there are rotation models, there are home and away models, and there's a flex model. Um, when we get into the rotation, there are three types of rotations um, that are out there, and we have the rotation station, we have the lab, and we have the individual rotation. When we set up the station for station rotation, uh, the most common things that I've seen is this four group, and again, this comes from the blendedlearningmodel.org website. Um, if you look at these four groups, you can see that there's one group where the teacher does the direct instruction. Then there's another group that will have technology integration, another group that will have uh, collaboration, and another group that will be reading the article. So if you go back to what I already said, that direct instruction piece is there, the technology piece, and that could be an assessment, or that could be some type of game, or that could be them actually just doing research, whatever you want them to do in that technology station, that's what you have to think about. And go back to your learning outcomes. What, what standards are you teaching for this lesson? And how can you develop these lessons are these portions in the stations for that standard. Again, teachers that have taught a lesson with a standard, if you break down and deconstruct your lesson, you'll be able to pull the different parts out and create these stations without much of a, a thought process because they are second nature. It's just making sure you pull out the parts to the whole. When you get into the collaboration, this is where the grouping becomes so important. I would make sure that I would spend most of my time trying to make sure the groups are conducive to the goals that I want to reach for this lesson. You can't just number off kids and say all the fours go there because that group does not have a purpose other than they have the same number. So these groups have to have purpose. And especially when you get that direct instruction, if you can make it so the students that are in need of a certain skill are together, then you can make sure that you are formally directing that information to them. Um, and this reading of the article is that basic skill station. But in this case, it would be reading for a purpose of that standard. So you can see that if there's four groups and you have you know 20 people in your classroom, that's five kids per group. So your direct instruction is going to be five. Um, you could also, when it's time, you know, a lot of people think, well, I have to get through this, all four of these in my 50 minute period. That doesn't give you a lot of time for station, which might be your need, but you know, you could do two groups one day, two groups the other. It just depends on how much work you want or how much time you need for each one of these types of situations. So that's something that you're gonna have to be a little bit flexible on and you'll get the timing down better as you go. So that's station rotation. Now I've added this one. This is something that I've developed that I think will work well. And there's a couple features to this. Um, I'm gonna keep the four groups, but I have five stations. And that will allow me, especially early on in trying to teach kids how to do stations, station rotation. If I leave direct instruction open, which is my station, I can then help in that first rotation to keep all these kids on task and get them in the right mindset. And once they get in that good starting 
phase of learning, it makes it more um, realistic that they're going to continue that type of learning throughout. You also will not get it interrupted in that first station. It allows you to really hone in on what kids need and what the questions are that may come up so you can answer those before they rotate. Now, there's another feature to this that I've added that seems to be beneficial, and that is to leave an expert in each one of those stations. So after the first station where you have no kids at your station, you can help all the kids out and make sure they get it. And then you are assigning one student to be the student leader of that station that will stay through all the rotations. This way, if there are any questions, that student will be the one answering the questions for that group. If that student can't answer that question, then that student, only that student from that group can come up and ask you questions to help clarify. This way, instead of having 20 kids trying to ask questions to you, you have four and that's it. You could do one additional station at the end to catch up all the kids that have not had the rotation piece of it where they were the experts. But that's something that, again, you're going to have to just be flexible in how that works and give them the opportunity to catch up if needed. Uh, and I think most kids would enjoy being a leader of a group. Um, and it's not always your most gifted students. If you have a book it that you're doing in your technology station, a kid can run a book it. Any kid can run a book it if they're taught. So make sure that we have you know, that understanding of when you have kids in charge, they are in charge of very specific things within a station. Uh, and sometimes I would pick the kids that are, you know, the most active because it gives them a little responsibility and it's a, a little bit of a focus. So again, leave one station empty so you can start them off in the other four. Then they wrote into you, which means there's always gonna be one station that's empty. And at that time, the person that's in charge of that station could come in and do some direct instruction with you if needed. So that's, that's a little twist on the uh, station rotation. This one, um, again, coming from our website is very typical of a science classroom, but this is not exclusive to science. I think we all remember our college days where we had a biology class that met Monday, Wednesday, Friday for an hour. And then on Thursday night, we would be there for two hours or three hours doing a lab. So it's the same basic idea where you have direct instruction to the whole group, and then you break down into partners or groups of three to um, do the work, the activity that goes with it. Now, in science, it's easy because they're doing experiments, but you can also do the same thing with um, reading and with writing and with social studies. It doesn't really matter. You, If you have a concept that you are trying to teach, to break them down and do partner work is not that uh, unrealistic. It's just different than what you might be used to. So the lab stations is, is another one that could work in any uh, curricular area. So this one, creates a little bit more planning on the teacher's part, but it does allow for more flexibility within the structure of each group. We have four areas, um, that, four areas of instruction and one where it's called the central tech learning. Uh, the teacher provides every student with a unique schedule. So there's not a group of students that rotates together. It's very unique situation. So if you know that you have a group of students when you do the first rotation that have a specific need for direct instruction, then you would assign them that station. Then based on the need of the student, you would then in the second rotation, send them off to the other three options to get other work done, depending on their needs. So it takes a little bit more time and setup. It does allow for you know the kids that may have a hard time working together to separate over time and they're not stuck with each other through the entire rotation. And that central tech area really allows students to formalize ideas that they get from other areas of this instruction. So if they have an intervention specialist, like if you have a co-teacher, they could be in charge of that station and intervention and help those kids that need it. So not necessarily everybody has to go to the intervention station. So it becomes much more flexible. It's a lot more work on the front end, but I think that you'll find that if you do this, you're going to create a learning situation that is conducive for every child. It, it, that, that's probably one of the best examples of how to differentiate instruction for the needs of the student in this kind of blended learning model. Now, you're not gonna have these options, um, but there are some things out there that if you do a little search for, for these terms, you're gonna find some other ways to differentiate and regroup. And sometimes the grouping can be virtual, especially we learned that in the pandemic. If you have access to um, 
Google Classroom and you have Google Meets and you have Google Chat or whatever it's turned into, you could have the kids group up without ever coming near each other. So these are things that you might want to look at. Just do searches for these. I'm sure you'll find them. If not, reach out to me and I'll send you the copy to the link. So these are the home and away models. And I say that because you have uh, teaching potential both home and away from um, school. And these are things that have become very prevalent during the pandemic age. So let's go through these. The flipped classroom is one that's been around for a long time. And I've used this with math classrooms with teachers in, in a district. And basically you just flip what you do in the classroom. So the homework becomes more of the lecture type direct instruction. And the classroom work becomes more of the practice activities that will go along with it or the implementation of those skills. So if you record a lecture um, as a teacher and you put it out there on your Google Classroom, the kids can watch that. Uh, and then you have that recording for anybody that's absent. You have anybody that's uh, you know taking a trip. They could always just watch that and be able to do or at least get the information from you um, that you would give in a normal lecture. But then when they show up in the classroom the next day, they're going to use that information to do an activity that will help reinforce or build rigor to that, that standard. So whatever that may look like, that's exactly how this is going to um, transpire in your classroom. You have all the elements that you would normally have in your discussion, but you're giving time back to the guided practice piece where obviously it's a lot more important for you to be there um, and easy for the kids when you have that um, help right there. We can't guarantee kids can get help with homework at home, but they can watch a video of a lecture. Now, we found that the kids don't, that don't do traditional homework also don't do video homework. Um, but there's ways to make sure that you have that opportunity for them to watch it because it's recorded. You can have them go into a computer lab during breakfast. You can have them go in after school. You could have them pull it up on their phone at lunch. You could, we were lucky, we could actually put it onto a, a local access TV station at a certain time so kids could watch it. Um, there's a lot of different things that you could do to make sure that happens. But the important thing is even if they didn't take advantage of any of those opportunities, you could just say, you know, before you get started, go over in the corner and watch the video and then they can get started. It's not the ideal situation, but if it's important enough to, for you to put out there as a lecture and direct instruction, then it's important for them to watch that at their time at some point to make sure they get what they need. So be flexible and be open to how you can deliver that, that message. This is one that has become um, interesting to me because the, the students can get um, this dual model where you have an online learning such as Khan Academy. So if you're teaching uh, the Civil War in your classroom and you want the kids to learn a different angle about the Civil War, you can assign Khan Academy to them and they can do lessons at home by watching Khan Academy, then they get here and that, that could be used as part of your classroom instruction or vice versa, however you want it to look. So they are getting dual time with the same topic with two different teachers really, and that's really a, a good thing. And then once they get into um, your classroom, you could have assigned different Khan Academy curriculums to different groups and they could take different angles with the same thing. So there are many ways to do this one also. Um, I look at it this way. It's still a, another way of doing homework, and you're going to have the same issues that you always have with homework. And if you look at the, the research on Hattie uh, Elementary School, there really shouldn't be that much homework because it's not as effective as you think. High school, it's, it's very effective and it's needed. So that leaves the middle school teacher sort of in a conundrum because we have a combination of elementary and high school kids in maturity levels. So we have to do what's best for our kids and make sure that we uh, are appropriate with what we assign at home. This is the pandemic model where the teacher is the sole um, direct instruction person, but it happens be either virtually or in person or both at the same time, which is not the, the best way of doing things, but this is something that because of the pandemic, we had to learn how to do. Um, we have gone, you know, if you, re if you recall, and if your district is anything like where I was at the time, we had a day to train everybody on how to do virtual lessons. And then we had a summer 
to you know get more get deeper into it after the fact. So this is something that obviously has a lot of tweaks that that are needed, but it's something that um, can be done. And again, thinking of all these different opportunities, you have to keep in mind that these are kids and sitting in front of a computer for six hours in a day is not the best learning opportunity. So we have to become more creative in how we approach kids, even virtually. Uh, the last one that we're gonna talk about is the flex model. And you can see here that, and I gotta move my face here so you can sort of see it. Um, the students create their own schedule and it works well with teachers that are integrating lessons. So when you look at uh, uh, social studies, language arts integration, you know, the, the kids will go what, to where they need. And you can see that there's time for them to do individual work. There's time to do small group. These breakout sessions could be, you know, if it's a integrated level or integrated lesson, you could have your language arts station there and you could have your social studies uh, part there. And it might not be by the teacher. It could be, you know, just led by students and they're having discussions on that. Um, if you have a large group collaboration on the topic, then they can all sit there and discuss. Um, so again, these stations are examples. You can do whatever you feel is needed to create the best learning opportunities for your kids. And if that means that you have no direct instruction here because you know the kids just need time to work, then we create different stations for that. But if you know that there are some needs for direct instruction, you could obviously put that in there. Uh, the interventions or the gifted stations, however you want to look at them, anything that has a special need could be a station. Technology is always a station, and however you use that, assessment is a station. So I just want to keep um, restating the same thing. It just depends on what the need of the classroom is on what's at these stations. Uh, this is um, sometimes for teachers a little bit of a nightmare because the kids will always want to be together, and that's not always a, a good thing. But it does start getting into that self-directed learning. And it's sort of important for them to start getting to that, especially as they get older. So a few reminders as we wrap up here. The pre-lesson setup is truly critical. Uh, putting groups together the way that you feel is going to be best for learning is truly critical. I would spend the most time on grouping and the setup. Uh, again, expect struggles. You have to make sure that if we do not do well in that first attempt, we try again. You know, we don't give up after one and we keep working on it. It's not going to be uh, super easy to implement if you've never done it before. If the kids have never done it before, they're going to have a really, really hard time doing it, uh, especially when they have questions. They don't know how to answer those. They, they're going to be coming to you because you you have trained them. Basically, that's you're the answer person for that. And we're trying to break that cycle so they become more self-reliant. Um, but do do things within your comfort level. If you're really unsure of how this is going to work, start with two stations, one with direct instruction and one where they might be online doing some type of assessment for you or where they're reading something or something that they've done in the past that you can put in there that starts getting them in the mindset that when you are with one group, they are responsible for themselves and the other not only for their academics, but for their behavior. So start with one or two groups and that or start with two groups and that will help move things forward. So when you get to three, then it's not as uh, foreign to the students. You're gonna modify as needed. You could do it one hour and have it work um, really poorly. And then you make the modification the next hour, it works perfectly fine. So be flexible in how you work things. Uh, do not overload your students. And when I do this with a staff, it never fails that I talk about blended learning at a, at a grade level meeting, then every teacher does blended learning within the next week and the kids are like, are we in stations again? So you may wanna talk with your fellow uh, teaching colleagues to see who's doing what. So you're not swamping the kids with one approach in all your classrooms because there's a need for variety and a need for uh, different styles of uh, approach. So make sure that we have that flexibility within your grade level teams or within your school in general. And obviously use Hattie, use Web, and most importantly, just use your teaching, the, the past teaching you've done. You don't need to change a lot. It's just a matter of rethinking what you do. Uh, trust yourself that you have all these the skills and the elements that are here, it's going to take a little bit of time to think about the deconstruction of those and how they would fit into different areas of this blended learning model. 
I, I think that if you have other questions, you know, you can reach out to me. I have a couple of emails here, norm at normpotter.com and npotter at vincentedu.com. I subcontract for them. But if you need me to come out and do some professional development, I'll be happy to set that up with you and, and work on dates. I am booking up pretty quick. I think I only have a few days left in October. And so you'll want to get in soon. But I hope this helps you. I hope that you uh, take into consideration this idea of blended learning and how it could benefit your kids. And I think that if you give it you know, a, a try more than once, you're going to find that this is going to save you time in the long run because you are getting multiple things done at higher levels with a very specific outcome in mind. So thank you for your time. Reach out if you have questions. Have a great day. And I hope to be back here very, very soon.